Welcome to this video about black holes and predominantly we're going to have a look at supermassive black holes and a possible upper limit that they have. And once they get to a certain size, they can actually stop their own growth, which sounds a bit bizarre, but this is what we're going to have a look at in this particular video. So we should basically start by looking at the range of black holes that we can get. So this is kind of dense objects, so white dwarf neutron stars, black holes, things like that. The we're interested in the black holes here, really. So we've got stellar black holes, you've got intermediate black holes, and you've got supermassive black holes. And these range from about solar mass sort of size, so the mass of the sun, all the way up to billions of solar masses for you supermassive black holes. And then this kind of void in the middle between the two, really, which is your intermediate mass black holes. So firstly, on the lower end, you can get black holes which are smaller than well, the stellar black holes, basically. So this would be smaller than your white dwarf. I say smaller, it means less massive, so less mass. Now, they cannot form from a stellar origin. So a stellar black hole will form when a very large star comes to the end of its life. It's, it basically ceases fusion in its core. It can no longer support itself to gravity and it collapses. And if there's enough mass there, you'll get a black hole. If there's not enough mass, you maybe get a neutron star or a white dwarf. So these small black holes can't be formed with that mechanism because actually that process will create a black hole that is about solar mass and a little bit bigger, which we have found so far. So the only way these can really form is thought to be uh, primordial black holes, which formed early on in the universe. So when the density fluctuations were such that there were parts in the universe that were dense enough to call or form black holes, you could have black holes much, much smaller. Because once you go over a critical density, it would collapse to a black hole. So you can get much smaller black holes. But it's worth noting that these are theoretical. We haven't found any of these yet, and it's likely going to be very difficult. And some of the very, very smaller ones, or the very low mass ones, would likely have evaporated due to Hawking radiation by now anyway. So we wouldn't even see them if they did exist. Then on the other side, you have your supermassive black holes. These are the largest black holes. And it appears that there is an upper limit at least observationally wise anyway, and there is a theory to kind of somewhat support that. And it's about 50 billion solar masses. That's kind of like the upper limit to supermassive black holes. And we'll have a look at why that's the case in this video. Now, there's a bit of a gap between the two. So we have stellar black holes and the smaller ones. And it's worth noting actually the stellar black holes and the supermassive black holes we have detected those or we think at least think they're black holes we know their mass at least but we haven't really found anything in between so if stellar black holes are going to grow to be supermassive black holes there's no evidence of that you haven't found any so there must be something else happening that produces the supermassive black holes and it's likely that they form from a different mechanism very early on in the universe but still, there doesn't seem to be much of a bridge between the two and a bit of a void there. So let's look at the supermassive black holes, basically where they live, how they grow. So most of them reside in the centre of galaxies. So right in the centre of most galaxies, you have these supermassive black holes. Our Milky Way has one. And if they are active, so when we talk about active, they are basically they're feeding or they're growing. So there's material falling onto them and that makes them active. We actually call them um, active galactic nuclei. So these are the centre parts of galaxies that are incredibly luminous. They outshine the entire galaxy itself. Some of them have these very large high energy jets coming from them. As you can see here, so you've got right in the centre is the supermassive black hole. It's essentially feeding or growing. It then has these jets coming out and it feeds from this disk of material orbiting, which then falls onto it. Some are actually dormant. So the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole in the centre, which is called Sagittarius A. Now, we've recently got an image of that, which was actually really exciting. And when we say we've got an image of that, it's actually the image of the disk around it. It's not the actual black hole itself. And the Milky Way or, the, or Sagittarius A at the centre is kind of 
somewhat dormant. It's not completely dormant. It is feeding some gas every now and then, but it's not a quasar or blazer, which we saw just earlier. So there is some gas falling on it and it is kind of still growing a little bit, but it's kind of classified as dormant really. So you can have dormant ones and active ones. Ours, luckily, is dormant. So if we go to the Hubble Galaxy classification, you have this tuning fork here, which you haven't, if you haven't seen before, it gives you all the classifications of the different types of galaxies that you have. And on the left hand side, you have elliptical galaxies. And on the right, you have two pathways for normal spiral galaxies. So these are pretty obvious. They are galaxies that have spiral arms. They're more disc-like. And then on the bottom one, you have barred spirals. So these are spiral galaxies that have a bar in, but they're basically the same. Our Milky Way actually is a barred spiral. Now, supermassive black holes are thought to exist in most of these galaxies. So most galaxies, regardless of their type, are thought to have a supermassive black hole at the centre. So they thought to be quite key in the formation of galaxies, their evolution and the, the dynamics, basically. So we know by looking at the active supermassive black holes that they are a significant part of the galaxy itself. So even though they are like size wise quite small, they have a very large mass, but they're only a small physical part size wise in the center they have these large jets and they will outshine the entire galaxy that they reside in but it's not necessarily fully understood why they're there how they grow there because they're they are very very large so to get to the size that they are there has to be something happening early on that basically accelerates their growth so something has to happen early on where they get to quite a significant size quite quickly and then the galaxies likely form around them or so there's a bit of a missing link really early on as to what might seed their growth but observationally at least we know that they're there so how do they actually grow then well as, as we mentioned before they mostly grow from an accretion disk so this is a disk of material that orbits around the black hole so let's say it's kind of gas and dust that's come from somewhere else in the galaxy it orbits around it it then falls onto the black hole and as it does so you then also get these kind of large perpendicular jets coming from essentially the poles of its spinning black hole and yeah you get these high energy jets we saw images of those actually from real galaxies and they are a significant part of the galaxy so they outshine the entire galaxy and these are limited perpendicular to that disk and this is basically how they grow so that gas falls on and they grow in size there is another mechanism which they can grow so if you look at galaxy formation theories one way of getting elliptical galaxies is with the merger or the collision of spiral galaxies now if two spiral galaxies have a supermassive black hole in each of them as they collide then you have a collision of two supermassive black holes and to make a bigger one. So they can grow that way as well as the galaxies merge and form. But most of their growth is thought to be from this kind of accretion method where material is falling on as it's coming from elsewhere in the galaxy. So these high energy jets, as we mentioned, they are a significant part of these galaxies and they can extend for hundreds of thousands of light years. So that galaxy in the centre is actually very small in comparison to these jets that are produced from these feeding and growing black holes. So as they grow, what happens is they are funneling gas from the outer parts of the galaxy. So you've got gas coming from outer parts. It kind of comes into the centre. It feeds the black hole. And things like barred spiral galaxies that have the bar in the centre can actually help funnel that gas into the center and they basically grow that way but when they get to a certain mass so about 50 billion solar masses the amount of gas that's being funneled inwards is so great that the gas actually starts to collapse on its way there and it forms stars so as that gas is being funneled inwards it gets collapsed and then you get stars forming in the normal mechanism for star formation which is the collapse of a gas cloud so that kind of accelerates your star formation in the center and you get kind of a, a significant spike in star formation 
Now, the thing with that is that the star formation and the subsequent supernovas that happen as a result of that star formation cause a feedback effect. So it's pulling in so much gas now that there's a, there's a huge amount of stars forming. A lot of them are going into supernova because they're large stars. And that causes a feedback, which is a bit like a, an outward pressure. It's, it's kind of resisting that gas that's been funneled inwards. So it kind of almost stops the gas moving inwards once you get to a certain mass. And that's around about 50 billion solar masses. So what happens then is the growth rate of that black hole pretty much stalls. It comes a complete crawl and it just can't pull in enough gas to grow them because the gas is actually forming into stars along the way, which then prevents the further collapse or funneling of the gas inwards. But something interesting worth noting, because that is a, a theoretical limit, is there are supermassive black holes that have been discovered that are kind of above that theoretical limit. So Phoenix A is a supermassive black hole and it has a mass of about 100 billion solar masses. This has been calculated by looking at some of the properties of it. It hasn't been calculated by looking at the orbital dynamics. So you can actually watch stars orbiting near it and you can work out the mass that way. Now, this is above that limit. Now, that's either wrong or it grew to a very large size very early on in the universe through a different mechanism. So it got big very early. So it wasn't limited by the, that accretion method, basically, that we just discussed. So it could be that that is what's happened here. But there is there has been a few discovered that are above that limit, which raises some interesting questions and highlights some things that we actually don't know about black holes at the moment. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.